Hello and welcome to our fourth lecture on shorter term versions of memory in module four in our summer series on cognition. Uh, we talked last time about uh, Batelay's model of working memory and its various components. Uh, today we're going to talk about specifically the subcomponent of working memory called the phonological loop. And the phonological loop, as you'll recall, is one of the three main systems we're going to talk about uh, in working memory, the phonological loop, the visual spatial sketch pad, and the central executive as all being components of working memory. There is, of course, also the episodic buffer, which we won't be spending too much time talking about. Uh, but let's get on to talking about the phonological loop. The phonological loop, as we uh, talked last time, consists of two components. The phonological store, which has limited capacity, holds information briefly, uh, and essentially the research that we covered in the short-term memory lecture um, number 4.2, I believe it is. Uh, all that about um, capacity of short-term memory, um, the length of short-term memory, uh, or duration of short-term memory, all of that really sort of encapsulates what we know about the phonological store to a great extent. We'll talk about some exceptions to that uh, and get into more details in a moment, but you can sort of park that knowledge right about there somewhere. Um, this also again gets us to uh, the articulatory rehearsal process. This is respons responsible for rehearsal to prevent decay from the phonological store. If you remember, of course, we talked about how uh, short-term memory, you can rehearse items to keep them in short-term memory. Well, that's essentially what's happening here is that rehearsal process keeps things from uh, decaying from the phonological store. And this holds uh, both verbal and auditory information. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, as I was saying a moment ago, there is a direct relationship between the photological loop and the classic short-term memory views. So certainly uh, our discussions of things like digit span forward uh, is a primarily a phonological loop task. Much of the traditional short-term memory data is captured in this part of working memory. Uh, and so I want to turn now and talk a little bit about uh, acoustic confusions, which we talked about in a previous lecture. We were this occurs to be the result of what we call the phonological similarity effect. Uh, this result adds support the, to the idea of a phonological process, uh, as in, because in these studies, participants saw letters but made phonological errors. And if you remember, we talked about the nature of the code in short-term memory as being acoustic. That's the same idea, but basically now we're talking about it being phonological, which is another way of saying acoustic. Um, so the phonology of it is how this information is kept. So it's the, based on its sound uh, and its sound in language is basically what we are thinking about here. So that work by Conrad on the um, acoustic confusion effect we refer to as the phonological similarity effect in working memory. Uh, a really interesting finding, uh, one of the primary findings that led to uh, this introduction of the uh, phonological loop and articulatory rehearsal process is what we call the word length effect. And what Badele and his colleagues found is that performance declined uh, in uh, shorter term forms of memory as the number of syllables per word increased. Now if you remember, in short term memory we thought it was number of pieces of information and nothing to do with how long words are, certainly not with how many syllables they were. So for example, in this top line, or the, sorry, this first uh, line of the example, we have Burma, Greece, Tibet, Iceland, Malta, and Laos. Six countries. Very quick and easy to say. That's relatively easy for people to remember in a, a short-term slash working memory task. Uh, however, Switzerland, Nicaragua, Botswana, Venezuela, Philippines, and Madagascar uh, are much harder to remember in working memory because it takes much longer to say those. They all have much greater um, number of syllables and it just takes longer to say them. So this indicates that the capacity of this memory system is linked to how long it takes you to say something, not how many pieces of information it is. And so that's a really different way of thinking about this kind of capacity. And so if you look at some of the original research, the proportion correct uh, for items recalled in uh, this task uh, declined pretty dramatically as number of syllables increased. So as you went from one 
uh, syllable words, about 90% correct. And remember, oftentimes we were talking about digits or even just single letters. Um, and so if it was a single syllable word, about the same as a, a letter or a digit. And then when you get down here to five syllables, um, the, the performance declines down to 50%. And so this is a clear indication uh, that the length of the word, particularly the length of the sound of the word, is an important component here. Another interesting finding um, that required some rethinking of short-term memory is your digit span uh, depends a great deal on your native language. And this is because your native language indicates how long a word is uh, or how long a digit is. So English, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So seven is the only digit between zero and nine, certainly, um, that has more than one syllable. Whereas Spanish, and pardon my bad Spanish accent, but uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve. If I got all those right, I'd be stunned. Um, but those Spanish um, words have more syllables. And so there's no reason to think that people who speak Spanish have worse working memory or people who speak Hebrew or Arabic. Uh, it's because the words take longer. Um, and so that's a really interesting phenomenon. And I certainly can't count in Hebrew or Arabic. So, um, which I wish I could, sorry. Um, so clearly, this digit span phenomenon is a function of that phonological loop. Uh, and so finally we get down to that capacity is really related to pronunciation time. So if you look here, um, again, uh, some work uh, by Alan Badalay and his colleagues, uh, you can see correct recall is directly related to reading speed. That is how quickly somebody could read through uh, the items. And it's really somewhere here between about one and a half to two seconds is about what most people can recall. And again, we're talking about some individual differences here. And some of this has to be has to do with the speed of capacity. So uh, what we find then is the limit of working memory in this particular instance in phonological the phonological loop is limited to what you can say in about uh, one and a half to two seconds, and that's a really interesting and different way of thinking about capacity of short-term memory. <coughs> uh, along uh, with the word length effect, there's some really interesting work with what's called articulatory suppression. Uh, and in articulatory suppression, participants are instructed to repeat an irrelevant sound, such as the over and over and over again to disrupt some processing of the phonological loop. So similar to that rehearsal prevention task we talked about in previous lectures. So this articulatory suppression is used to then examine the functions of the phonological loop. So let's take uh, an example. What I'd like you to do is count the number of words in this sentence. Should have been relatively easy eight words, right? Now, I want you to say the over and over again and read this next sentence that's in yellow. So say the over and over again and try to count. What you probably found is it's much more difficult because you can't say the sentence um, to yourself because you're busy saying the, 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 so trying to say the, four was put in. You can't do those two tasks at the same time, so you have to switch to a visual spatial task. Whereas we're more efficient at looking at words based on what the word means and saying the word to ourselves. But here now you have to look for spaces. And in this case, that's a less efficient way to accomplish the task. What's interesting about this is um, this really eliminates the word length effect. Um, so short words are no longer remembered better than long words. Long words aren't really remembered any better or worse either. Um, but that difference is completely eliminated by suppressing that articulatory process. And so what this indicates is that word length effect is entirely due to the capacity of that articulatory rehearsal process uh, or the capacity of the phonological loop. So some applications of the phonological loop include language acquisition. So as we're trying to learn a new language, uh, the phonological loop is particularly useful for that. And problem solving. And again, well, you all have some experience with this. As you talk your way through a problem, 
that's how you solve it. And so that's an important uh, application of the phonological loop. Finally, with some neuroscience research, um, it has been shown that the phonological loop tasks tend to occur in the left parietal lobe. This makes perfect sense because this is consistent with language being a primarily left hemisphere task. So we really expect that to be happening. And so you can see as somebody's repeating words over and over to themselves, this is happening generally in the left hemisphere, particularly the left parietal lobe. Well, that gets us to the end of uh, our discussion of the phonological loop. In our next lecture, we'll be talking about the visual spatial sketchpad.